Welcome to Subcut. Welcome back to Subcut. Look, it's been a long time since we've done an episode. Um, we're the medical-ish podcast where we talk about things that might be relevant for uh, high school students, med students, or anyone interested in healthcare. And I think that's how our intro used to yeah, go. Something like that. It's, it's been, been it's been a while. My name is Justin. I used to be a doctor. My name's Neil. I'm a fifth year medical student. Wow. And our guest today. Uh, which if you are watching on YouTube, which you definitely should be, and if you are, make sure to like and subscribe, uh, is the medical registrar who is... My name is Bo. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so uh, me and Bo have been friends for a very long time since before, uh, in the pre-med days. Uh, and um, I, you know, left the medical field and then Bo decided to stay on. And uh, so what, what we're going to be doing today is talking about what life is like as a medical registrar. We had um, Sanjeev on a number of episodes back talking about life of a surgical registrar. Um, and he was talking about, you know, what it involves on like a daily basis and all of that sort of stuff. But today we'll look at medical, uh, what a med reg's life looks like, cause it is pretty different to uh, what a surge reg's life would look like. Not so different for house officers, but for the registrars it is pretty different. So uh, we'll go into that. So, Bo, can you start by telling us about what, uh, you know, what your morning kind of involves? What time do you wake up? When do you start? And what's that kind of routine if you talk through it? Just like a typical, typical day. Uh, so, as a mid ridge, I guess you wake up, I live pretty close to my hospital, so I wake up probably 6.30. Yeah, maybe a bit closer, sorry. I wake up about 6.30, 7 o'clock-ish, and then get ready come to hospital, try and get there before 7.40ish, I guess. Um, a lot of it's quite similar to the house office that sometimes you print the list, you get your list ready of your list of your patients. Um, and based on these patients, you prepare for the rest of the day. Uh, what you do depends on what day of the week it is because uh, there's different ward rounds depending on what day it is. Um, usually there'll be a consultant ward round on what we call the post-acute day. And then other days there'll be mostly registrar ward round, which would be me seeing the patient. And, and uh, how how different is you know your let's say what time you start compared mm-hmm. to like department to department? So you are on Jerry's at the moment. You were on Jimmy before. Is there a big difference in terms of like time of starting or what that morning routine involves? Um, Jerry's is pretty much a lot slower than Gen Med, which is pretty good for me right now. Uh, back in Gen Med, the pace is a lot faster because um, I guess I first have to explain about acute days. First, first, actually, we need to explain about what Gen Med in, in, is. What, yeah. what, what, we, what we're talking about in terms of Gen Med, okay? So, yeah, yeah Gen Med stands for general medicine, right? So, mm-hmm. but if you had to explain general medicine to someone that, you know, only just barely knows what the difference between medicine and surgery is. Okay, well, um, okay. Let's go back to basics. Um, in terms of a health problem, there are ways to treat them. And one arbitrary definition is if it's treated with surgery or treated with medication, I guess. Yeah. Pharmacological, non-surgical. And um, this is a generalization, but general medicine will uh, basically entail those that are treated with medicine and not with surgery. Um, if you go a bit deeper, then there's uh, also procedures that medicine will do. But uh, I think probably we can start off with just that yeah. basic definition. Yeah. So, so yeah, basically, you know, surgery is treating a problem with surgery, which is basically what people, I'm sure, are uh, imagining when they think about surgery. And then medicine is treating people with. I mean, rather than saying medicine treats people with medication, I think it's more accurate to say that like, if it's not surgery, it's medicine. Cause medicine is like a pretty big scope of things. Cause there is interventions and there are like procedures and things. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Uh, that's arguable from a medical perspective, <laughs> uh, but we won't get into that. Um, but, um, yeah, for at least more of a layman's terms, that's pretty much right. Okay, so uh, general medicine. What are we talking about when we say general medicine? Um, Yeah, so medicine is then split up into a lot of other categories, such as cardiology, uh, rheumatology, renal, whatever. And um, uh, and that kind of depends on your hospital. 
For example, if you're living in a rural hospital, you might not have a cardiology team or a renal team or a gastroenterology team. In that uh, kind of setting, um, all those kind of specific issues will be covered by general medicine. If you're living in, uh, or if you're working in a more um, central hospital, um, you will have all these services. Uh, and the way those are uh, divided and also kind of depends on what time of the day it is. For example, during daylight hours, eight to four, these specialty services will be here. And so um, patients can go to these kind of services uh, based on what kind of specific problem they are. But for example, after, uh, after 4 p.m. on nights before 8 a.m., um, those services are not necessarily in hospital. And at that time, general medicine or the med reg uh, handling these kind of issues. Yeah. Okay, so you, you get to work and then you um, prepare, well, help, you know, with the health officer, there, there's a list of all the patients that you're seeing. You know, so far it's basically the same as, you know, what a surgical registrar, um, you know, might be doing or just, it's kind of the same kind of routine. So what happens after you have this list of patients and then there's this uh, ward round with the consultants where you're seeing all of your different patients. Uh, based on that ward round, you get a list of, plans and ways to manage these patients. So what does your, what does your day look like after that? Um, so I think it's, it's probably best to talk about the system first. Um, that way we can kind of, because um, my day will be different depending on which ward round or consort and ward round. Yep. Um, so I think the way to talk about that, to talk about what a med reg does, also depends on your service of medicine in the hospital. Um, so for example, in my hospital right now, Patients are coming in every day and uh, coming into the general medical service every day. And um, there are multiple teams uh, in general medicine. And uh, not every team will be taking new patients every day. So it's kind of split up uh, throughout the week. And that's just that's purely just a load balancing. Yeah, exactly. So one team doesn't just end up getting all the patients. Every day. Yeah. And so... Uh, for example, my team might be taking patients uh, twice a week. On that day, it's called your acute day, okay? And then uh, the day after that is the post-acute day. And that day is when a consultant will do the ward round and they will see all the new patients because it's always best uh, for a new patient who's come in to have a consultant uh, review them the very next day. So. And and, that, and that's just safety. because yeah it's a safe it's a safe yeah, safety thing yeah yeah um, so uh, if you follow me we've got these post acute days now acute days and post acute days on post acute days a consultant will see and then on non post acute days usually I will see uh, the the uh, registrar will see and uh, kind of just shuffles like that and so in terms of my day to day on the consultant ward round day is usually the busiest day because we'll have all these new patients oops, put into our list. Uh, and then the consultant will see all of them, plus or minus the old ones, old patients. And then after this big ward round, we will have, uh, unfortunately, medicine, just because we've seen the patient doesn't mean uh, your day is done. Uh, <laughs> after you've seen the patient, you've addressed issues and uh, you get it plan for these issues, that's when you then manage these issues. And actually, let, uh, let's talk about one thing, big mm -hmm. difference, right? Neil, what's the big difference between a surgical ward round and a medical <laughs> ward round? I don't get to sleep in. <laughs> um, yeah. Apart from, apart from the start time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it'll just be the pace of it. Um, and the actual things that they're looking for is, okay, like, are you, is there anything imminently bad for you right now for the surgery side? Tell me, tell me a bit more of the pace. Out of the pace? Yeah. Um, I am jogging. Usually, it's a good workout in the morning when you're walking down the wards. Um, for surgical. Whereas for surgical. And for med, um, oh gosh, you start at like 8 and then you finish at 2 p.m. or something. It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit much. Okay. No, yeah, not, also, not, well, not much enough. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's, it's uh, yeah, medical ward rounds generally take a lot longer. Mm. Uh, the amount of time that you spend per patient with a surg uh, in surgery is, you know, sometimes like, negative amount of time it seems like you, yeah. it, within seconds sometimes you could you could be done you know faster than your hand sure. could write the note yeah whereas within medicine it's like you could yeah. be with a single patient yeah it was for you know like 20 30 minutes and jerry's maybe 
or even yeah. in GenMed was like a, a very first patient that you're seeing, you know, you could be spending a very long time with a single patient. Yeah. And there are probably very, uh, there are very legitimate. So why, why is that? Well. Why is yes. it that? I have a good explanation for that. <laughs> and uh, I have a good quote from my consultant. Okay. Uh, <laughs> because obviously we do, uh, we do, house officers do rotate and uh, all consultants and all teams will notice that uh, house officers uh, have their change in attitudes when they've changed from one service to another. For example, when I was a health officer, obviously I have the same experience. When you're a house officer, you come off a surgical team, bang, 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 uh, really quickly, and then um, go, eat, go eat breakfast at like 9.30, yeah. chill through the day. Yeah. Um, and then you come from the general medical service, and then uh, water runs a little bit uh, harder to uh, get through. Um, so I think um, the best reason of this difference in time of ward round is because of the way these two services treat patients. Mm -hmm. uh, surgeons treat patients with surgery, not with... Um, uh, so when they're ward round, that's not when they're doing surgery. That's when they're examining the patient and taking a history. Uh, and that for them is to decide whether or not the patient needs surgery or um, be a surgical manner or you know, explaining things, things like that, that takes a lot less time. Their um, long, tedious ward round is their surgery. Whereas for us in general medicine or, or in any medical, medical field, um, the way we decide on our treatment uh, is, based on, is much more based on uh, clinical exam and history. We don't, have, we don't treat based on surgery. Yeah, so, yeah. right. So basically more of the job is getting done during the ward round for medicine, whereas yeah. in surgery, it's only just kind of the filter for surgery or not, plus minus a couple other things, obviously, but yeah. largely, yeah. yeah. Which actually does make sense. And yeah. funnily enough, I didn't really yeah. think of it that way. I My just consultant thought, used to say, uh, general medicine's theater is our ward round. Yeah, no, I can see that, yeah. And the, like, oh, mm, I might be naive in saying this and stuff, but I feel like there are, your, my general medical. Shut up. <laughs> I feel like, you say I feel like there's a, of course, I know. That's why you can correct me over here. But I mean, um, I feel like the consultants in gen med uh, round of uh, ward rounds tend to juggle a lot more, like a lot more, uh, several more different problems as opposed to just a very like focused thing on surgical related or not. Mm. Um, That's definitely true. Yes. And oh, see, yeah. I'm not naive. <laughs> Um, but like, yeah, and like there are, I, tend, I think they tend to be a lot more chronic issues and stuff and there are already so many different factors playing into it that you have to take into account. Yeah, um, generally our patients are more older, more mm -hmm. comorbid, mm -hmm. um, with more um, different medical issues, whereas, uh, for example, um, under a surgical team, um, they do focus on... Uh, like acute issues. Yeah, as, yeah. more surgical, surgical issues, yeah. Especially in a hospital setting, uh, a public hospital setting, the people that are going to be in a public hospital are not going to be the ones that are all good in their daily life and then they just needed to get like a hip replacement or something because it was just like causing them pain. They're going to be the mm. people that have a, had a fracture or they fell or there's going to be, you know, something that was a little bit more acute and imminent. Mm. And so they don't need to care so much about the chronic things. Yeah. But who knows? Maybe, well, I don't, I don't know. Like in a private surgeon's like clinic, do they take these like really long histories to learn about their diabetes and no private well surgical clinic will not be talking about these issues anyway. They will they they will be talking if necessary long times about their surgical issues. Yeah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've done the ward round. So depending on whether it's a consultant or a, um, a registrar ward round, it's a little bit different because the reg ward round is run by the registrar, obviously. Mm. And then they're the ones that are going to be creating the plans uh, about what to do. And the consultant one is the one that is usually a little bit longer, a little bit more thorough. And then the management plan is a bit um, deeper, but maybe a little bit longer reaching as well in terms of like, mm -hmm. uh, like more precise, basically. Yeah, yeah, ba yeah, basically. Uh, just better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so after, after that's done. Okay. So what it's like, it's like two, two, 3 PM. Like, do you have lunch? What's going like, what do you do then? Do you just go home after the water round? What happens? No, unfortunately you can't go home. You now have, uh, your list that was in the, uh, is, will be much different from your list that you had before the water round. Cause, um, while you're doing water round, 
um, each patient that you've seen and you get a list of jobs and you, you're jotting down the um, what you got to do for each patient. And by the end of the board round, your list will be really full with a lot of jobs and things. And um, so your mission next basically is to tackle all these jobs. You have to decide how to prioritize them, what ones to do first. And then once that's done, you hopefully get to go home. Yeah. Yeah. As long as nothing goes wrong, as, <laughs> yes. as long as nothing goes wrong on the ward, as long as you don't have a patient that's suddenly really sick and then you have to deal with that. And obviously it being a hospital is a high likelihood of that occurring just generally. Could you give some examples of those jobs that you're talking about? Oh yeah. Like for example, um, the most uh, highest priority ones would be um, requesting imaging, for example. Wait, 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 can we do it this way? Because we've got a student here, oh. and I was a house officer, and then you're a reg. Okay. So there, each 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 role has a different type of job that you would do, mm -hmm. right? And so I think this is actually quite useful to see, like, what is the daily life like? Uh, if we look at what does the day involve for, like, in, in a medical specialty. So let's start for, with you. What would be the the roles or the jobs or the tasks that are that you get as a student? Yeah, sure. So as a student, it's pretty much the exact same thing for every every time I'm on placement really. And my priority is to learn. So whatever thing that can maximize my, you guys, were you guys like bad too? Did you just leave before? No, I never no, did no. that. What are you talking about? Uh, what are you laughing at? No, no, nothing. You keep going. Oh, oh, we'll comment so, I'm sorry. I feel so belittled. I, I, well, that's uh, something rich as or house officers cannot, <laughs> not control. <laughs> You'll love anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the priority is to learn and stuff. And we do have, you know, requirements coming through our placements itself from the university. And so um, with basically every single um, consultant or registrar that I've asked, you know, what's the best way to maximize my time on placement? The answer has always been Clark patients. Um, talk to them, mm -hmm. take histories, do examinations. Um, because now that I think of it, like, and people were saying this to me at the time, but you're like, you don't have that much time on a, in general medicine, for example. Um, you like, you'll hear about it here and there, but it's like gen med was one of my first runs in fourth year. And it's all, I've already started to forget like what, what we used to, um, do, um, back then as well. Um, mm. but otherwise I'd say those would be the main jobs and maybe, um, whatever the like registrar said, might give you yeah, an yeah. additional following them around sometimes fun task. Or... Um, house officers tend to do, I think all from memory, probably what a lot of paperwork, but I'll let you answer on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, well, like the, you know, the, the priority is for the student to learn. Mm. Having said that, you know, we've, we've talked about this before is that the medical um, field is like very weird and that most of your learning happens clinically, but the system is also not set up for learning no, very yeah, well. So yeah. all of your learning is kind of like fit in on this. It's like sort of forced in and crammed in, yeah. you know, like if you'll be on a ward round and then there's a student there and you'll be like, oh, okay, I better tell the student something about like what we're kind of doing yeah. or like just trying to involve the student in something and just teaching them things mm. here and there. And then if the registrar has time, they might t take you for a yep. little, see a particular interesting case. Sure. Or, and that's like, yeah. oh, what a blessing. Like if we get the chance for that. So often you just find yourself being busy and you know, like I, I think honestly speaking, I was a bit mindless in my approach walking around in ward runs just because I had no idea what was going on. It was also earlier in the year as well. Um, but then once I started being a bit more proactive, I just said like, oh, okay, I need, I need a clerk, a patient. And can I, can I present to you what I've done afterwards? And that's probably the best time. Oh, we'll just be like, nah, it's <laughs> off. <laughs> He's like, I gotta, I gotta study. Like, we won't say that on uh, this like, video. I'm uh, worried. <laughs> um, <laughs> nah. And so we'd, and so we'd go do that, come towards, you know, midway through the ward round or towards the end and we'll do the present. Yeah. Um, otherwise, like with what you were saying with, you know, the learning on and off uh, yeah. placement strictly, um, I've definitely found that over the course of the past year and a bit, um, I really do appreciate my silent study time with my like yeah, yeah, my book yeah. at my desk or something like that. Um, because it's, I, I found the, the hospital experience in terms of learning, like you said, it's not exactly primed for the student, um, but it's just really fragmented. And unless you know exactly, you've got an objective in your day and you know what you're looking for from a particular experience, you're sort of just going to end up with these like disjointed learning experiences that you have to try and like fit together to make you feel like you've been, you know, you've done, yeah. you've been effective in your day. Yeah. Um, but otherwise I, I, I often feel that I'm a lot more effective when I sit down, look into a particular case or, or, or a disease and treatment and stuff. And then I'm like, okay, now I know this. And then once I know the information, actually see it on placement itself. 
Yeah. So I'm more so just more so checking my current knowledge in placement rather than learning from scratch on placement. Yeah, because often if you learn something new in placement as well, you're just kind of struggling to hold on to it anyway. So it's yeah. like then you yeah. have to go and then consolidate yeah. it. And a piece of paper looks like like a debauchery <laughs> yeah. after some time. No, it's terrible. Um, but but you know, little bits of teaching that happen here and there can be pretty you know, yeah, useful. Yeah, definitely. For yeah, and I've had amazing amazing ridges as well. I don't know if Mo was one of them though. Probably not. But anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, as a house officer, the difference would be that you know house officers are, are responsible for the execution of tasks, and we talked about this before. So if they are planned, a lot of the getting the gears turning and uh, you know getting people together from different um departments or different members of the team like physios or occupational therapists or you know different nursing staff and just trying to coordinate things that's where most of the house officers work is but i think the main thing is that all the house officers work sort of sits below the ceiling of responsibility and difficulty so if it's something that requires real specialist or, or even deeper levels of understanding experience expertise or the level of responsibility is greater or the risk of conse the consequence of failure is higher then all of that generally gets relegated to the registrar and then there's this gray line in the middle where you're a senior house officer so you're kind of experienced enough to be doing that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and you're not quite a registrar yet but generally speaking you know house officers are very much so in the execution of like all these daily things that just get the gears turning uh, so, Bo, what, what are your tasks more like? Yeah, so uh, as a registrar, as a, um, if I go back to after the consultant one around, you have this list of tasks now of how to take care of your patients. Um, after consultant one around, the consultant finishes and it becomes just me and my house officer now. And we now have to tackle uh, the best way to finish these tasks, essentially. And uh, registrar's job is to oversee that, um, and we. The, this is where uh, it depends on how senior your house officer is and how how comfortable you are um, with them tackling certain tasks, and uh, and depends also how con controlling the registrar and how hands on the registrar is. But uh, I'm probably kind of in the middle, and uh, when we've got this list of tasks now, then I will kind of oversee and um, go through them with my house officer and I decide which ones we will do, basically, split them up. Um, generally speaking, the uh, main uh, deciding factor is efficiency, okay, because we all want to go home before 7 o'clock, um, and as well as safety. So, for example, a very difficult task that um, that requires discussion with uh, a lot of specialists or family members, things like that, explaining a lot of difficult medical things. Obviously, I will do that, um, and um, because I have more experience in the house officer. And uh, uh, other tasks that uh, require less medical knowledge um, uh, will go to the house officer. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that is how we split up the tasks. Yeah. Um, since you were previously a house officer as well, was there anything that you'd add from to Justin, given your experience? Mm. Oh, and even as a student may add. Yeah, I'll, I can probably add more for the, from the student perspective. Oh, really? Okay. Because um, obviously we've all been there. Mm. And uh, as a student, we all just want to learn when we're in, uh, on the ward round. And um, before you go into clinical gears, you think you're going to learn so much from, uh, from uh, going to the hospital. Mm. Wow, uh, everyone's going to be uh, focused on me <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be a great medical student and the uh, whole team's going to love me kind of thing. And then uh, unfortunately, um, the hospital is not there for students. The hospital is there for patients. Mm. And uh, the students um, uh, become a bit uh, on the background. Um, we just don't have the capacity, mm. obviously. Um, and that... That's why, um, as you said, you have to be more proactive as a student to, um, to learn. Um, so from my perspective, when I was a student, um, I quickly realized that um, you're not going to learn a lot um, from the ward round. You do see that your consultant, your registrar, your house officer are all very busy. Um, that's when, because I've been working in busy hospitals. It might be different in less busy hospitals. But um, I think... The best part of learning as a student um, in the hospital is basically from exposure. Um, exposure is where um, you can consolidate your knowledge. Um, but to do that, you 
you have to do, as you said, the, you've got to put the time in at mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the best way to learn as a student is um, after you read up on stuff or, or after word round, you see, oh, all these diseases that I've never heard of, uh, all these treatment plans that I never knew about, and then you list that down and you go home and you have to kind of read a textbook about that. Um, and being exposed like that will help you remember them more. That's just the ward round part of things. But on other days when we're on acute or when we're seeing new patients and things, that's another way for you to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the note of studying, mm. okay, so uh, t like explain a little bit about this idea of having to study while you're a registrar. Like why are you studying? What are you studying for? Right. Like what specifically you know, in terms of the volume of stuff I use, you know? I'll try to get into that without being too depressing. <laughs> uh, okay. So... I've been a registrar for almost two years now, I guess. And um, you will be studying a lot as a doctor um, throughout your years. Basically, um, the way I see it is in PGY1, your first year of house officer, you don't study. You are getting used to the system, getting used to a new job, and you're busy and you're stressed, you don't study. Then when you're after that year is when you kind of start studying. In PGY2, you're, you know a little bit more, your job's getting a bit easier, you're starting to think about the future. You're starting to think about being a registrar. And you'll start to see that the registrar has a lot more responsibilities, has to make more decisions. So they actually have to kind of know, know a lot more um, medicine. And that's when I started studying in around PGY2, PGY3. And just by the way, you know, for those of you who are just unfamiliar, PGY is talking about postgraduate year. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, PGY1 is your first year. First year out, second doctor. year out, third yeah. year out, etc. PGY1, 2, 3. Yeah, so I pretty, because I was really stressed as um, about becoming a registrar. And um, uh, that's so I kind of started studying before that, um, around six months or so before becoming a rich. So when I was a house officer, um, PGY2, PGY3, that's when I started studying. So I'll. Um, and then when you become a registrar, you unfortunately haven't done enough study to know everything. Uh, so you kind of continue studying for a while. What are, you, what are you studying? Like, what does your studying look like? Yeah, so that can go very deep. Um, my studying kind of changed a lot um, throughout the years. When I was, uh, so kind of in my early, very early registrar days, I was studying... Um, uh, I was trying to study a broad amount of things and not too deep yeah. because um, as a doctor, um, the scariest thing is coming to see a patient and you have no idea what they have and you have no idea what to do. Yeah. And so you always want to know, oh, I've heard of that at least. Yeah. Then you know what to look up at least what, even. What to look up later on. And so is this from a textbook or what? Like you just have a textbook and you go home and just smash through it every night? Or yes. What, what, oh, that? That, uh, what did I do back then? Yes. I uh, I, I did study quite a few textbooks um, as well as something. Oh, called, oh, yeah. Well, not reading like in depth, obviously, but like, um, uh, so things you got to study. How, how deep do you want to go? Anyway, uh, things, uh, things you want to study. So, so, what you got to be to be a doctor is you have to, uh, when you see a patient, um, obviously your goal is to fix their problem. To do that, you need to find out what the problem is. And that, to pay, um, you need to learn how to take a history, how to take an exam. Um, to do that, um, you need to learn um, how to basically, when someone comes in with a presenting complaint, um, you need to learn what kind of questions to ask what kind of examination to do and what kind of investigations to do. So that's the first part of medicine. And uh, there are specific textbooks just for that, which is really good um, to read as a doctor. And then the next part of medicine is once you've um, kind of know what you're dealing with, how to treat it. And then there are other textbooks for that. Um, so, so those. How many, how many hours a day is this looking like? Mm -hmm. Like what were you structuring? Because you'd leave, what time would you leave work? Uh, that also depends on how, what kind of run you're, um, what run you're on and how senior you are, uh, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. When I first started, um, as a registrar, um, I was probably f first few, first few weeks, first few months, I was probably finishing at 
six, six every day, something like that. And then. So it's roughly like a 10 to 11 hour day, something like yeah. that, roughly. And, yeah. then, and then you have long days and you have nights. And long days are roughly 15, 16 hours. Yeah. And then you don't really, obviously you're so stressed because you, you don't know a lot of things yet. And so at that time I was going home to study for that as well. So you get home and then you'd study until what? Until I go to sleep, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe what, like three, four hours of study a day after work? Uh, maybe not that much. Probably get a bit tired. Yeah, two or three hours. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so two or three One hours. Hour, two hours. Yeah. Yeah. So, but consistent, consistently. Yeah. While you're while you're working. Yeah. And then, how did that change? Oh, that changed. Uh, so then. Then um, once you become a bit comfortable with being a registrar, then there's another thing that comes into your life, which is your exams. Um, and those are needed to um, progress as a doctor, basically. Um, and so for me, for the last year, I then changed studying to study for my exam. <laughs> Uh, and tell me, tell me a little bit about this exam. Like, how difficult is this exam? What is the exam? F well, let's. Uh, what is the what is the exam for? So I'm in the College of uh, for Medicine, basically RACP Physicians, and um, we uh, in our part part of our basic training, um, there are two exams you got to get through. Um, the first one is a written exam, um, just all MCQs, and the second one is a clinical exam where they'll have patients in front of you and you have to examine and. Uh, in front of examiner. So uh, the first thing is the written one. And um, so there's going to be students that are listening to this, mm -hmm. you know, in high school, maybe you're in med school and they're like, oh, MCQ exam. That doesn't seem too Easy. bad. Yeah. One in five. Yeah. How much do you want to overwhelm these guys? Like? Uh, well, <laughs> tell me, tell me about the exam. Like, is this a difficult exam? What is the MC? What is the MCQ? It's like, what do you need to study to be able to pass this exam? The aim of this podcast, let's just say, is to inform to, people. Is to inform people and break down the opacity that's currently there. So yeah. Yeah, so I've just come off a whole year of this. So um, I guess I might have a bit of a biased view. Uh, so not to scare everyone, but uh, basically the exam is all of medicine. They can just ask anything they want in any MCQ. Uh, yes, but uh, the, uh, the light of this is that the, um, the pass mark is quite low. Hence the pass rate is quite high. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, is the pass rate high because uh, is the pass rate high because of the fact that if it was too low, like no one would be able to like progress through? Or is the pass rate high because well, so, people are studying a lot? Um. So what our college says is that um, they after they've done after they've taken all the results from this uh, written exam, they will then do kind of like a belt curve. And then they somehow decide on the standard that you are yeah. expected. And um, I don't think we know how they decide that. So, so there's going to be people that will think, well, you know, if you've already graduated medical school, mm. like, shouldn't you already know I'm all even, of medicine yeah. by then? Like, shouldn't you already? Yeah, sorry, mate. You don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> after you graduate medical school. Yeah. Sorry. No, uh, I'm like... When you yeah. first told me that, I was yeah. I was in complete surprise. Can you give us percentages maybe just, I know, I know you're speaking from your field specifically, Yeah. coming out of medicine, sorry, finishing from finishing your degree to what you know right now, suppose what you know right now is 100%, how, yeah. much, how much do you think you knew or how much do you think you should know outside uh, well, once, once you, you graduate? graduate. Once you graduate. Uh, say that again? <laughs> so like if, if, if what you know right now is 100%, yeah. How, what percentage do you think you would or you should be at once you graduate? Oh, to be honest, I was probably like 5%. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's just such a low number. I didn't expect 5%. But I was a... You studied quite a bit. You studied quite a bit. Uh, I wasn't a very good medical student. I, I didn't okay. really study that hard. I, I, I don't think you were a bad like, medical student. Yeah, though. I don't Obviously think you were. Obviously things, but... Like, That's why I said, um, what should that percentage be? Honestly, I, I, oh, it's he, fine. Look at me, I'm here. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think honestly, like, te like te if you if you so if you ten, reach yeah. above ten percent, then you uh, will just be phenomenally uh, equipped. What's then to know more? <laughs> I feel like hey, this is what is it? Illusion of explanatory depth. Yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, so there's a basically, you know, there's more than everything you learn in medical school. There's more than that to study after you've already graduated, purely for this exam, basically. Yeah, and I've it's been like more than five years now. Um, you still do need to go through medical school. That will create the foundation mm. for you to learn how to be a doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or yeah. how to. Yeah, so you don't learn to be a doctor you learn the foundation in order to learn to be a doctor <laughs> wow six years huh? yeah so let's say that we are uh, you know in medical school studying for a particular test okay well second year third year students they'll they'll learn a particular topic for how long like two two months two three months mm-hmm. and then they'll have a test on that particular module like for example that could be musculoskeletal system nervous system um, you know about the kidneys about the heart things like that and then at the end of that, they'll sit this test and that test is like a big stressful thing for them, right? And then that will be like a three-hour exam or... Yeah, two hours. Two, two hour test. How long is this uh, exam, by the way? Oh, our exam was um, 170 say. MCQs put into two. Oh, 170, okay, into two. Um, Which in a way... Five hours, I think. Three-hour thing and a two-hour thing, something like that. Oh, so it's a two-part? Two-part thing, yeah. Okay, so oh. total is a total of five hours split. I'm gonna, I, been a while something like that now yeah um and then so you'd study you know med students are studying you know not every med student is studying like every single day but i would generally say that med students are studying at least every single week like pretty consistently sure pretty consistently people are going to be studying Mm -hmm. whereas um you know and all students have uh, like lectures right and then you know lectures finish how how many hours a day are lectures like including labs and other group activities it's like Mm -hmm. four or five hours Mm -hmm. a day and then all the rest of the day is for whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Whereas, Bo, when you're working, you're working like, you know, 10 hours, you know, a day sometimes, 10, 11 hours a day, sometimes, sometimes long days longer. And then after that, you have to try to study and you have to within what, like a year, a year and a half study more than the five, six years of medical school combined in order to sit this mm-hmm. exam. Mm-hmm. I probably well, like you. Pro- you probably learn a lot more on the job anyway. Now that you're there more regularly, yeah, you you definitely learn a lot more as a registrar because mm. um, it's kind of a um, snowball approach to learning. Um, when you don't know much, you don't know what you know, and um, that kind of makes it harder for you to learn. Is this relevant? Yeah, and um, once you know more, it's much easier to um, gain extra knowledge on that foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's what I think. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we've basically gone through your entire day until the point where you um, eventually go home and then you finish studying and all of that sort of stuff. You sit this exam and then and then what? Like generally speaking, not too detailed, but generally what, what happens after you, you pass your first exam? So after you pass the written exam, um, you are then invited to take the next exam um which is the clinical exam um and uh, when is that roughly that for me that'll be in june um so i guess i'll let you know about that then eh? but, uh, <laughs> so from what i know is that then you unfortunately you go back to studying um for that exam and uh, that exam you will, will be a, very different um the written exam is all about um uh, like scientific knowledge, whereas the clinical exam is about your clinical skills, the way you take a history, the way you um, examine the patient, um, the way you elicit uh, examination signs, and the way you present your findings and the way you talk to your patient, basically. And um, uh, that would be a lot of stations. Um, and uh, once that's done, Hopefully you pass, and then, um, then the next thing you got to think about is um, what kind of specialty you want to do and applying for those specialties. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if you're a medical registrar that's passed that, then the next thing you might look into is, for example, cardiology. If you want to, if you have an interest in that, you'd go down that pathway, and then certain certain training programs might have another exam at the end of that to you know kind of graduate from that training program. Which is again an enormous amount that they have to study, and usually people will study for like years for that. Well, in fact, the whole training program is basically leading up to that exam. Um, 
but then some training programs don't have a exit exam it's simply you just go through the stages and then you naturally progress on to eventually becoming a consultant in whatever specialty that is mm. Mm. yeah so um you know pretty different to uh pretty different to s surgery you know obviously with sanjeev what we talked about by the way if you guys haven't listened to that episode go check that one out it's about you know, getting that plan at the beginning and then going in and operating and getting theater time and getting exposure to all of that sort of stuff. Whereas for a medical reg, it's a lot more about just the, uh, well, non-surgical management, but just uh, working a lot more with the house officer, working more to, you know, just create and execute on these plans, strategizing and supervising, things like that. So I would say it's a little bit more of a, uh, sitting, thinking, um, trying to like problem solve a little bit more where surgical is a little bit more about like uh, the practical hands-on skills aspect of it. Like, you know, it's the difference between, I would say maybe like, would, you, would this be a good analogy is that for, surg for surgical, it's like how good is your like craftsmanship? Um, whereas for medicine, it's like how good is your um, ability to like design the, design or something or um convince the ship to build itself or something <laughs> the analogy <laughs> the analogy kind of crumbled a little bit the ship sank hmm. i think in the end we all have different ways of treating a patient's problem um but we still have the same goal um we do have uh very similar parts in our jobs uh, for example we haven't gone into the acute days yet um, that's just a post acute day when a patient's have already got a plan. Other days is when I have to see the patient who's just come into hospital. And that's when we admit a patient, the clerk a patient. And those are the days where we, um, there's a whole, there's a lot different from the post acute day where you're the one that sees the patient first and uh, you're taking the full history and exam. You're deciding what investigations to do and uh, you need to make sure they survive until the next day. So this um, is a diagnostic process, basically. You've got an unknown con condition that you're trying to problem solve and figure out. Yeah. Which is the same for basically what surger surgeons would, would do as well. Yeah. And then other times you have to hold, uh, the best part of being a medical registrar is when you have to hold uh, something called the on-call phone. And uh, Sanjeev uh, in surgery used to call this the grenade. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And um, that phone is basically... Uh, anybody in Murnamore that wants advice from the medical service, um, for example, uh, um, someone's under the orthopedic team, orthopedic patient has some uh, chest pain, uh, obviously orthopedics, um, that's not their specialty, they need to talk to someone from the medical field. And so um, they'll be calling me about that. And uh, Or um, sometimes GPs may be doing the similar thing. Um, so that's the phone they can ring and... Uh, there's a whole other part of your job where you um, see what kind of phone advice you can give, um, things like that. Triaging over the phone, basically, and yeah, um, and and just as a clarifier, you know, when Bo says that's the best part of being a med reg, I that was a bit sarcastic. Yeah, that's not the best part. That's a you know, that's the worst part. <laughs> just, of, uh, <laughs> just in case that was not clear, um, you know, getting called, you know, pretty much constantly. And, and that's the same time when you're trying to see your patient. Yeah. And there's a level of responsibility, obviously, because you're not even seeing the patient and yet you have to be able to discern enough through the phone to give advice that is responsible enough because your words are basically the words on behalf of the medical department of whatever hospital you're working at. So there's a lot of responsibility that goes um, into that. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, I suppose like one way to summarize everything we've talked about, but also get a bit more information. Um, what specifically do you think makes a good physician? Not a good doctor, because we can spend hours forever on that, um, but specifically what makes a good physician? Like a medical mm. doctor, yeah. Wow, that's a hard question. Oh. Um, just think of all the attributes you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad it's not on me this time. <laughs> mm, that, uh, well... You will, and you, to be a good physician, you need to have a wide range of skills. Um, mm -hmm. You need to be a good diagnostician. You need to um, have good uh, clinical skills. Um, and 
you need um, very good good personal skills to communicational skills to um, uh, communicate with your patient and also communicate with other services. Um, those are probably the most important skills, I think. Yeah, that I can think of right now, anyway. For me, I think it was the ability to stay awake in a ward round is probably is this a, a skill that I just never had. So I just, it's a lot easier to stay awake when you're the one that has to make the plan. Yeah, you're probably right. And there's five other juniors looking at you yeah, and well. family members looking at you. It's much easier to stay awake. You don't really need much sleep for that. Yeah, gosh. Okay, well, um, yeah, that pretty much comprehensively covers what it's like to be a medical registrar. And, you know, one of the things is that what can't be really spoken or explained is the cognitive process or the emotional process or what you're getting out of it personally because it's you know we're talking about the what you're doing um but different people with different personalities are going to feel differently about these tasks so for some people they might listen to this and think like man that sounds like absolutely horrible super super boring extremely dry whereas another person might look at that and and think that that's really fulfilling in a different way and you know that's one of those things that you don't generally know un unless you actually have experience in it which is why a lot of doctors yes even doctors and i know that your parent wants you to become a whatever neurosurgeon but look even doctors don't know what specialty they're going to end up in you know they they could be three four five years out and still not have decided what specialty they want to land in because they're um just tasting different things and trying to see what suits their personality uh the most mm -hmm. And this is a very natural, normal process. And I, and I think rushing that process is not saying that, you know, I, I don't think anyone would really advise someone to rush it um, unduly when they don't feel like they've got a kind of tendency or leaning towards um, one thing or another. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, there, there's stuff that we're talking about in terms of the daily life, which is quite routine, but there's some stuff that can't be communicated without you ha actually having experienced it on a daily basis to see whether it's you know enjoyable or fulfilling for you so just you know keep that in mind um but yeah that's basically it neil do you have any other questions that you want to ask bo basically uh what we talked about but just what you were saying at the end like take everything that we say with the understanding that like there is often just one person representing or the same people representing whatever we're saying so don't be completely disheartened but don't like throw your life savings into into a particular field that you I feel like I've made it seem like this last few years has been horrible but mm, I still mm. think it's the best job in the world yeah yeah, yeah. so I, yeah I love my job so yeah I mean if you if you take nothing away from this is that if you disagree with anything that we've talked about or if you're not happy about it then it's Bo's fault <laughs> and you can directly contact Bo to <laughs> complain about it and you know we welcome you to actually you know, do that so just remember that um, and and on this, phone. yeah <laughs> Uh, and obviously, you know, the more important even than that is just to like and subscribe and to share with your friends. I have to leave a comment down below about what you think. Anyway, thanks for listening to uh, the episode and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in to Subcut. If you guys have any suggestions for content, please make sure you send it through. You can get in touch and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube or find us on our website at jttmid.com slash subcut. Subcut is a podcast brought to you by JTT. If you or anyone you know is interested in a career in medicine, make sure to get in touch and check us out at jttmid.com.